these two people have on the international level, and the national, in national work as well, of course, really contributed in a, in, in a most admirable way. Jennifer Preston, who's going to start it off, is the program coordinator for Indigenous Rights for Canadian Friends Service Committee, <coughs> the famous Quakers. Uh, the best accomplishment she's ever had is that she's taught actually Canadian studies, even if it was at Waterloo, where you water everything down <laughs> compared to what we do here at uh, compared to what we do here at Trent. So she's an academic of that sort. She's a writer uh, as well as an activist. She's the co-author of Realizing the Uni United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People: Triumph, Hope, and Action. One of the longest titles that has come out in the area and is uh, very busy working in international forum for the uh, preservation and, and, and uh, 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 the expansion, uh, uh, the recognition of uh, Aboriginal rights. Paul Joff uh, is admittedly a lawyer, and he uh, spoke eloquently about lawyers and <coughs> the problems of law and lawyers <coughs> at dinner. We did invite lawyers to come tonight. I, I don't know, is anybody here a Peterborough lawyer? They usually don't go out after dark in the fraternity for pretty obvious reasons. They don't like to walk in the dark. Paul actually had bird poo on his jacket. Was it, was it in New York City? It was in Geneva. Bird poo in Geneva is famous, of course. And uh, he was a lawyer out after dark, and uh, when he went to check his jacket, they stole his computer. So it's dangerous in many ways for lawyers to be out after dark. So. It appears we don't have any. It would have been nice if they'd come. He'd been very involved in the question of the, uh, the preservation and expansion of Aboriginal rights at the international level, worked uh, for uh, and continues to work on the issue of the United Nations Declaration. And in Canada, he uh, has a long uh, legal uh, career <coughs> in the interests of Aboriginal people, particularly in, uh, in Quebec, which is where he started. Uh, going all the way back to the James Bay Cree uh, issues in the... When did that start? 1969, 1970, when it really got rolling? Yeah, I didn't, I would, I didn't start then, but that's when it started. When it started, yeah. yeah. But you must have come on board. Bruce, when was the referendum? The Cree referendum? 1995. I know, I'm not sure. 72? I can't remember. 72. Or I asked Bruce because Bruce took French students up to the to the actual referendum. Remember, you were at the voting, yeah. the polling stations, etc., and, 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 and so forth. So he still represents the Grand Council of the uh, of, of the Cree, and I think our old friend is is leader of the Grand Council of the Cree again. It's me, Matthew uh, Matthew Kunka, who I, I must mention, uh, and I did the other night still owes Dallin McCaskill an essay, so I don't know whether they've held his degree up or not. <laughs> He's the author of uh, the book Sovereign Injustice, Forcible Inclusion of the James Bay Cree and Cree Territory in a Sovereign Quebec, and is co-editor and contributor to the book Realizing the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, Triumph, Hope, and Action. We've heard that before. You all should have gotten a copy of the United Nations Declaration, and. I guess we're going to refer to that, right? There'll be a quiz later, maybe? Good. So, thank you for coming out, and thank you to Jennifer and Paul for, for coming along on a snowy, what a cold evening, actually, and uh, I'll get out of your way. Thank you very much. Oh, excuse me. All right, now, unlike John, I'm not going to do a stand-up comedy routine. Um, but uh, thank you, John, for that, and thank you for having us here this evening. And as he said, Paul and I are going to do a tag team presentation, so um, make it a little more interesting for you. We're going to do a little back and forth um, from the same presentation. This being the cover of the booklet that you all have a copy of that we gave out, um, this is where we're starting. Our presentation tonight is on the UN Declaration, and one of the reasons we wanted you all to have a copy of it is that a large part of our presentation will be on implementation. And of course, the first stage of implementation of anything is that you have to engage with it and know what it is. And Paul and I, Paul representing the Grand Council of the Crees and myself representing the Quaker Service Agency, we work in a coalition with a broad range of partners that has a mandate of implementing the UN Declaration. On the back of your booklet, you see the other partners that are in our coalition. 
And so um, one of the first things that this coalition did after the declaration was adopted was um, make this pocket-sized version to make it accessible to share with people. And we have, since 2007, we've distributed about 140,000 copies of this pocket version of the declaration. And we will be referring to it, but there will not be a test. Um, so um, when, before we start, we wanted to uh, start with a couple of, of, of thoughts that we want you to carry with you as we go through the material this evening. Um, the first uh, being about the cost of injustice, and this being by Justice Abella, who now serves on the Supreme <coughs> Court of Canada. And the second being on human rights, the rule of law, and democracy. And this comes from um, a declaration of a general assembly on the rule of law. And as you can see at the bottom of it in the reference, it's adopted without a vote, which is in, in UN speak, that means it's a consensus adoption. There is no state calls a vote, therefore it goes through by consensus, which means that all states at the UN support. And this is um, language that's been repeatedly affirmed in many UN instruments. So tonight we have a fairly um, rich and full presentation, uh, and we're going to uh, gallop through it at a decent enough uh, pace, we hope. Um, <coughs> We want to cover some of the background on the Declaration because we don't know, you know, necessarily how much people know about what the Declaration is and where did it come from. So we'll start there and also then going into international human rights law and the significance of why is the Declaration itself important and its legal status. Then we will move into specifically on implementation, which is tied, of course, to reconciliation and the federal government's actions against the Declaration. And then finally, we're going to finish off dealing with... Um, Indigenous government's consent and cooperation. So when we look at the background of the declaration, um, this instrument started, the drafting of this instrument started in the early 1980s in Geneva. And it, there was known, it was known within the international human rights system that there was a known void in the work that had been developed to date and that there was nothing that specifically addressed the rights of Indigenous peoples. And it was well known that around the globe, Statistically, it's about 370 million indigenous people in 70 countries around the globe. Um, and, and to give you a little perspective on that, 2% um, of that resides in the countries of Canada, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, of indigenous peoples globally. And so that uh, historically and continuing, indigenous peoples are the most discriminated against and there was an urgent need to address violations against them, including widely land dispossession, colonization, and the effects of assimilation. And so the declaration began in the early 80s, and it continued until the final adoption was in 2007. So you have more than two decades of negotiations, which makes it the most discussed instrument in the history of the United Nations. And one of the reasons that it took that length of time to negotiate the text is because, um, well, the UN is essentially a club of governments. That's what it is. Um, but here we had an instrument that was, for the very first time in the history of the UN, being developed with the rights holders themselves. So in, rather than just being the room being member states' representatives hashing out what's going to be in this text, it was member states and indigenous peoples' representatives. And so uh, thereby being the need to spend two decades doing the negotiations. Um, and Indigenous peoples played an equal role with states in developing this text. Um, and that is a critical part of its legitimacy. And in the end, of course, it had to be a text that was agreed to by both Indigenous peoples and by member states. And so the final text is a balanced compromise. If the text had gone a little further in one direction, member states would have ceased to have supported it. And if it had gone a little further in the other direction, Indigenous peoples would have walked away. And there was an agreement that the UN would not adopt a declaration that didn't have support of Indigenous peoples. So now we have the most comprehensive international instrument that addresses Indigenous peoples' rights and affirms political, social, economic, cultural, environmental, and spiritual rights. It was adopted in June of 2006 by the UN Human Rights Council. At that time, Canada was on the Human Rights Council and was the only state in the world that was prepared to call a vote so it was not adopted by consensus. Canada called a vote, and Canada and the Russian Federation voted against it. Uh, in the normal course of UN instruments, it would go from the Human Rights Council 
moved to New York, to which is where the General Assembly lives. And, and what you would normally expect is later that year, the General Assembly would have adopted it. But instead, um, politics intervened, and there were states that did not want this declaration to uh, come to fruition. And so there was a lot of politics. And so instead of being adopted, there was a pause uh, where the UN said, well, you know, maybe we'll have a little more negotiations because 20 some years was not enough. And so, unfortunately, the difference in New York is that New York is all about politics. And Indigenous peoples could not and did not have the same access to those negotiations in New York. However, there was a commitment by many states that were supporting the Declaration and supporting the Indigenous peoples that were working on the Declaration to ensure that both that the Declaration would not be lost and also that a Declaration would not be adopted that Indigenous peoples didn't approve of. And so finally, in September of 2007, the Declaration was adopted with nine amendments to that original text, and those nine amendments were agreed to by the Indigenous representatives that had spent the decades working out that text. And this is what that moment looked like. So here we're in the General Assembly Hall. This picture is sort of the bird's eye view from where Paul and I are sitting, which is up in the nosebleed section, um, uh, which is where they let the lawyers sit. Um, and so we have the president of the General Assembly is at the podium, and that's her on the screens looking up. And she's looking up at these boards the, uh, where the green is. And what it is is that when they adopt UN resolutions, all the member states at their desks have buttons, and they have a red, a green, and a yellow button. Um, and so then the president of the General Assembly will read out the resolution, and the states have their opportunity to vote. Um, the yellow is an abstention. So there had been so much politics around developing the Declaration that even those of us who were really close to what had been going on, we didn't know, like really, really, we didn't know what anything could have happened in that moment. And so when she read out the resolution and there's this sort of moment and then all of a sudden those screens went all green and so um, that was the global affirmation of this Declaration. And there's four red marks uh, on those screens, and the four red marks came from Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the United States. And so, with four states opposed, the declaration was adopted. Um, since that time, since September 2007, those four states have all reversed their positions. And um, Canada's endorsement came in the fall of 2010. And the reason that Canada endorsed the declaration is because Australia and New Zealand had already changed their positions and it was well known that uh, Barack Obama was going to change the US's position and Canada decided that they didn't want to be the only state in the United Nations that did not support rights for indigenous peoples. So on a Friday afternoon at three o'clock, Canada posted a press release to a website um, stating its endorsement, which is the best way to kill a news story. So there was no news story. Um, and although, although it is a good thing that Canada has endorsed it, I mean, now we have, it is now what is called a consensus instrument because there is no state in the world that formally opposes and that, it, that increases its legal effect, the fact that it's a consensus instrument. However, unfortunately, Canada's positions around and attitudes around the Declaration hadn't changed since the time that it opposed the Declaration, which is, although with one, uh, with one small caveat, I will say that the day after Canada announced its endorsement, I had an email from a bureaucrat in Indian Affairs who we'd known through the years of working on this, who said to me, oh, Jennifer, can we order some of your booklets? So um, since they'd endorsed it, they decided they should distribute our booklets. Um, so now Paul is going to talk a little bit about um, international law. Okay, so we'll examine now the role of international human rights law in Canada. <clears throat> Indigenous peoples are both international and uh, domestic actors. Can you hear me? No? Just, we're just having a little trouble hearing. Yeah. Is that? Thing? No, it's a light. Actually, this is actually a light, not it's a mic. Not a mic. I'll <laughs> speak louder. I have a softer voice than uh, most people. So I'll start again. Indigenous peoples 
are both international and domestic uh, actors. And indigenous peoples increasingly represent themselves in international standard setting processes. So one may ask the question, why do indigenous peoples go to the UN and other international forums? There are at least two reasons, although uh, there are others, but two main reasons is the first is to seek justice and combat discrimination and dispossession in their own countries. And the second reason is to develop new international standards that reflect their own perspectives, values, and laws. So we have on the screen here a quote from um, the Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin. And she said this in 2002. And she indicated that Aboriginal rights from the beginning, as you can see on the screen, have been shaped by international concepts. And Canada cannot ignore new international norms. And she added that Aboriginal rights are an international matter. So this is part of showing that international human rights law very much has a place in Canada. Now in this 1987 decision, the former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, Brian Dixon, ruled that declarations and other international human rights in instruments are relevant and persuasive sources for interpretation of human rights, including those in Canada's Constitution. And the Supreme Court has affirmed this rule of interpretation in subsequent cases. Now, another rule of interpretation by the Supreme Court which is relevant in this context is that legislation in Canada will be presumed to conform to international law. And courts will strive to avoid interpretations of domestic law that would be in violation of Canada's international obligations unless the wording of the statute clearly requires such a result. And as we shall see later, a key international obligation of Canada is to promote and respect the right of indigenous peoples to self-determination. Now here is an example in 2012 where the Federal Court of Canada ruled that the UN Declaration and other international human rights instruments such as the Convention on the Rights of the Child, may be used to interpret domestic law. Now, contrary to Canada's claims that the UN Declaration is only aspirational, this is a concrete example from the court of how the Declaration is given legal effect. So that's it. She gives me the small parts. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit about the significance of the Declaration. Um, and the, this quote that we have up on the screen comes from the former Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, James Anaya. Uh, and and what, what the essence of this is, is that the Declaration is not about creating rights. The Declaration didn't make rights. The Declaration affirmed the international human rights uh, protections at, and in the particular context of indigenous peoples. So you took the specific circumstances of indigenous peoples and took the existing international human rights structure and applied that. And, then, and that's where the articles that are in the declaration come from. So they're not new rights, it's a global framework. And it's also important to note that neither the United Nations nor member states of the United Nations grant rights. That isn't how it works. Rights are affirmed. So these are inherent rights, which is actually in preambular paragraph 7 of the Declaration, that they are affirming the inherent rights of Indigenous peoples. And these rights, as Anaya is saying, are firmly ground, grand, grounded in the international human rights um, uh, system. This is from the Secretary General of the UN, Ban Ki-moon, 
that the, the Declaration is a blueprint of reconciliation. The Declaration provides a framework for both partnership and for decolonization. And as what the Secretary General is saying, is that the Declaration gives a framework for states for building relationships or rebuilding relationships with Indigenous peoples. And clearly, this framework is urgently needed in Canada and in other states around the globe. And also clearly, this relationship, this partnership, uh, can't be based on unilateral decisions made by state governments. And this comes from the Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, also known as EMRIP, which is a body of the Human Rights Council that is the uh, global body that uh, deals with Indigenous Peoples' human rights at the United Nations. And the EMRIP has said that the Declaration is a framework for justice, reconciliation, healing, and peace. And these are obviously essential elements in addressing past human rights violations as well as ongoing human rights violations. And clearly, this kind of framework is completely in opposition to the realities which have existed and which continue to exist, which are grounded in a philosophy of power, where a colonizing state intends on maintaining a firm grip onto power. And this is a paradigm that must be changed. There has to be a fundamental shift in that type of approach and, and it is, the Declaration is providing a tool to make that shift. This comes from uh, the Rio Plus 20, from the outcome document of Rio Plus 20 on sustainable development, the future we want. And what it shows, because it was adopted without a vote, so it's adopted by consensus, and so what it shows is that globally, all member states of the UN have actually committed to what are the importance of the land rights of indigenous peoples, as affirmed in the UN Declaration, and the significance from a global to a local level. And so that, including Canada, affirming, uh, affirming the importance of the Declaration in that context. So now that we've said something about that it's important, so what do we do with it? How do you use the Declaration? And we'll get more into that as we carry on. Um, there are uh, many ways to use it and many more ways to explore. The Declaration interprets Indigenous rights and state obligations, and that includes in the Constitution. So Indigenous rights and Aboriginal and treaty rights are affirmed in Section 35 of the Constitution Act 1982. And some people have said that Section 35, the problem with Section 35 is that it's an empty box of rights. But in fact, the UN Declaration gives us the toolkit to say what are those rights? What does Section 35 mean? And the Declaration provides that toolkit. Um, the Declaration also can be used to fill in gaps in treaties, um, understanding treaties, particularly in the numbered treaties that uh, may have had less detail when they were constructed. And the Declaration can assist with elaborating the meaning of those treaties. The Declaration can be used uh, to guide negotiations and litigation, and it is currently being used uh, both in Canada and globally in negotiations and litigation. Negotiations often dealing with resource development, um, and litigation often dealing with resource development and land rights issues. And in fact, um, and we'll both address this a little bit later, but the uh, last year, the Supreme Court of Canada was the Chilcotin Nation case, um, which is a historic case dealing with land rights in Canada and uh, the organization that I work for joined with Amnesty International Canada and we were interveners in that case and our Paul was part of our legal team and the, our intervention was based on how the Supreme Court of Canada has to use the UN Declaration and International Law when the Supreme Court is addressing land rights at the court um, and so that is a way that the Declaration can be used in litigation and we'll, as I said, we'll both talk a little more about that later. So the Declaration also um, uh, can be used in negotiations with corporations or other third parties, and a lot of First Nations are doing that currently. One of the things that we often see is um, either legal teams for corporations or for the government trying to have a pushback on that and say, oh yeah, you can't really use that, and which, which is inaccurate. Um, and so the Declaration is growing in that regard. So as you can see, the Declaration helps us to transcend uh, the existing box of domestic law. And so now Paul will talk about the legal status and effect. Yeah. And there's some more. 
the declaration was adopted as an annex to a General Assembly resolution, which in itself is not legally binding. However, as James Anaya, who's the former Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, has emphasized, the significance of the Declaration is not to be diminished by assertions of its technical status as a resolution. And he goes on to say that implementation of the Declaration should be regarded as political, moral, and legal imperative without qualification. Now, as the UN Office of Legal Affairs clarified in 1962, a declaration is a solemn instrument relating to matters of major and lasting importance where maximum compliance is expected. And this is the position taken by the International Law Association when it uh, examined in detail the UN Declaration in 2010. And the ILA added that the UN Declaration is deserving of utmost respect. And again, this is also the position supported by the New Zealand Waitangi Tribunal in its report of 2014, where it looked at the Declaration. And in 2011, the Tribunal emphasized that the, the Declaration, quote, represents the most important statement of Indigenous rights ever formulated. Now, the Declaration is not binding in the same way as treaties, but it does have diverse legal effects. And as discussed earlier, Canadian courts may use the Declaration to interpret human rights in Canada and international treaty bodies may use it to interpret human rights instruments. And an example is the Committee on the Rights of the Child, which has a general comment, which is a document showing how to interpret uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity. They call it general comments. And this one is on indigenous children. And this general comment is used to interpret the whole Convention on the Rights of the Child whenever you're dealing with some issue in the Indigenous context. Now, the Declaration contains provisions that reflect existing customary international law and may contribute to crystallization of new customary international law. So the question is, what is customary international law? Customary international law for it uh, improving a certain norm is customary international law, you basically have to prove two elements. And if you prove them, then that customary international law is legally binding. And the two elements, one is state practice. And state practice means that most states, not all states, must adhere to the norm in practice. And the second element, is there must be a belief by most states that they are legally required to respect a particular norm. And it's not always easy to prove what is customary international law. Now, examples of customary international law in the UN Declaration include the international principle of pactus sunt servanda, which means that treaties must be honored or kept the prohibition against racial discrimination, the right of self-determination, and the right not to be subjected to genocide. Now you'll see in the uh, first paragraph there, there's a reference that some customary law may also be peremptory norms. And a peremptory norm is customary international law from which no derogation is permitted. And examples include uh, prohibitions against genocide, torture, slavery, and racial discrimination. It was interesting that John mentioned your next talk in this series is with Alan Gabriel.
And um, uh, this uh, picture here, and I have a copy of it if anyone wants to see it afterwards. Um, one of the things that Ellen organized after the declaration was adopted was having a translation done in Mohawk. So this was done in her community, and um, uh, if anyone wants to see what the declaration looks like in Mohawk, I, I have it here. Um, and one of the reasons, um, this is really important as we start our section on implementation, because I said, as I said, implementation is about engaging with something. But it's also about the fact that the Declaration has to be available in Indigenous languages. So the Declaration has to have meaning on the ground, in communities, in, in Indigenous languages, but also in Indigenous worldviews. So when they did the translation of this, it's not a literal word-for-word -word translation. Ellen worked with um, an elder who's an expert in her language on the concepts. This is what the Declaration is saying. How would we say that? And so that's what we have in the, in the Mohawk translation. Um, and uh, uh, that is a huge piece of implementing the declaration, is making it, making it real at that level. So we're going into the section on implementation. And of course, part of implementation is reconciliation. And this is a quote from when the Special Rapporteur did a visit to Canada. And when he finished his visit and he uh, released a statement at that conclusion, that visit, and part of what he said was that Canada faces a crisis, and he discussed the well-being gap, and he also discussed the high levels of distrust. So clearly implementation of the declaration is critical in Canada. Um, if, we're, if we know that we have a situation that's a crisis, and we know that there's a well-being a well gap, and we also know that there's a high level of distrust. So then, then what are we doing about that? And what are we doing to implement the declaration? So if we look at implementation, and we're starting with crisis, as identified by the Special Rapporteur, and we move from crisis to hope. And this is a quote, uh, this is a quote from an institute that studies hope. Um, and about hope is about thriving, and about not giving up. And one of the things I wanted to also um, point out, John mentioned this book that Paul and I edited. Um, when the declaration was adopted in the fall of 2007, right away the indigenous leadership in British Columbia organized a three-day symposium for people to learn about what the declaration was, where it came from, what does it mean, how do you engage with it. There's about 300 people that came over the whole three days. And out of that, uh, Paul and I were asked by the leadership if we would edit those presentations into a book. And so, so that's this book. Um, you should all be teaching it and learning this book. Um, so uh, when this book came out, then the leadership in BC sent the book around to various uh, uh, leaders in the West. And one of those, when it arrived in the Yukon, it arrived at the bank council office. And he thought, oh, I know someone in the community who might be interested in this book. So then I get a phone call at my office, and uh, this man says to me, Jennifer, he said, I'm 78 years old. I've been waiting my whole life for something good to happen to our people. And I read your book, and I learned about the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And he said, and now I'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off, telling everyone they have to read this declaration. Um, and so, you know, that's a story of hope. And that's a story of someone who had been working, he had been doing the right, the way he had tracked me down is in the 1970s, he was based in Ontario, and he was working with the Brotherhood in the Kingston Pen, and it was the Quakers in Toronto that were funding him to travel from Toronto to Kingston to go and visit the inmates. And so that's how he knew how to track me down. And here he is at, at 78 years old, that this declaration gave him hope that maybe we were moving into a different reality. So if we start with crisis, and then we go to hope, and then after that we go to healing. And this, of course, when we talk about healing, we're talking also about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the connection between the Declaration and the Human Right and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And that connection is actually um, quite substantial in that one of the commissioners, uh, Chief Wilton Littlechild, is one of the people who was instrumental in the negotiation of the Declaration over those two decades of work in Geneva. And Willie's now one of the commissioners on the TRC. And the TRC is using the Declaration in their work. So what does reconciliation look like? Justice, uh, the Chief Commissioner, Justice Sinclair, has repeatedly said in different forms and in different ways, if you thought the truth was hard, reconciliation is harder. 
And implementing the Declaration is part of reconciliation. And it will be hard. Implementing the Declaration will be hard work. And especially when we know that we face the resistance uh, from the governments um, or from corporations, it will be hard. But it's essential that people engage with this. And it's essential that it's engaged with in an intellectually honest manner and in good faith. And that is what makes the Declaration a blueprint for reconciliation. So when we talk about implementation, if we started at crisis and we move to hope and then we move to healing, it seems only completely natural that next we will move into land rights. Uh, so the Declaration has many articles that deal with land rights. They start in the Declaration, the land rights section starts at Article 25, and we're just going to put two of the paragraphs up on the screen for you. But when they, when in this particular one, in Article 27, we're talking about a process and having a process. And so one of the examples of implementation that we wanted to share with you is that currently in Canada, the government, the federal government, is having a review of the comprehensive land claim process. And in the summertime, they appointed a special ministerial appointment to uh, do a study and then give a report back to the government on how the comprehensive land claim process should be review, revised and updated. And so the coalition that I mentioned that we both work with that, that does implementation work, we developed a submission to that, uh, to that particular review. And we met with the special ministerial representative in December, his name is Douglas Seifert, um, also a lawyer. Uh, and uh, uh, our submission to him was on how, if Canada's revising comprehensive land claims, that the declaration has to be the framework they use when they're looking at land rights in Canada. And that was essentially the basis of the information that we brought to him. And we said, we want that to be part of the review that happens. And of course, here in Article 27, when we talk about a process, that can apply to comprehensive land claims. But it can also apply to pre-Confederation treaties or into numbered treaties. And, in the, and it's specifically in issues where the topic of surrendering land has not actually been satisfactorily addressed. The Declaration can give us some tools for that. So. When we're moving along then, then that takes us to restitution. And what does restitution look like? Because if you're going to have reconciliation, then you have to include restitution. Reconciliation is more than an apology. Reconciliation is more than saying sorry. And apologies have to mean a commitment to change. And if we're looking at restitution and the, and the right to redress, then overhauling a comprehensive land claim process has to include that, and it has to include <coughs> moving us away from that colonial paradigm and moving us into a better reality. And that overhaul of the comprehensive claim has to have that. And that needs to include what the standards are that came out in the Chipotle Nation decision that I mentioned earlier and Paul's going to give more details on. And it also has to include the international standards from the UN Declaration. So the last piece that I'll say about implementation is that implementation is something that everyone can engage in. And what we have here is three types of implementation. Social, legal, political. Social implementation, everyone can be involved in. And in fact, coming here to this presentation is an act of social implementation because you're engaging with this material. Social implementation can happen at educational institutions, but it can also happen all over the place. Human rights agencies, community groups, faith-based groups, Paul and I and some of our other colleagues have met with all the human rights agencies in Canada, the federal, provincial, and territorial human rights agencies, uh, to encourage them on how they can use the declaration in their policies and in their work. And um, they also have distributed thousands of our booklet. And in fact, someone at the Canadian Human Rights Commission called me up. And she said, Jennifer, this is the best known human rights instrument in this country, and that's because of these booklets. Which also shows you, when you make something simple and accessible, <coughs> Um, then uh, it, people do engage with it. So the fact that it's not on, you know, eight and a half by 11 and you have to cart it around, th I mean, that makes it real to people, helps people to engage. Legal, as I mentioned, um, as interveners in Chocolate Nation, we brought this up in our intervention at the Supreme Court. And in our intervention, what we urged the court to do was to come up with a new framework when it came to land rights based on this international structure. And in fact, we believe they did come up with a new framework at looking at land rights, uh, as Paul will explain. And political, 
Political implementation can happen at many levels. Political implementation can be happening at the national level. Currently, MP Romeo Saganash uh, has a private member's bill, Bill C-641, um, that's on the table, as it were, um, which is about implementing the declaration. Romeo actually also worked on the declaration um, and uh, engaged with our coalition before he was a member of parliament. Another way that it can be a political implementation doesn't have to be at the federal level. Uh, the city of, of Fredericton, New Brunswick, at the town city hall, does, um, somebody brought forward to city council a resolution that the city of Fredericton should endorse the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. A and they did. And they, they said that in their dealings with Indigenous Peoples in their area, they would be using the Declaration as their standard. Now obviously on the municipal level, there's a lot of symbolism involved in that. Um, uh, but it also, it's a, it's a really good place where at the community level you can see non-Indigenous communities engaging with the work of the Declaration. Obviously Indigenous governments um, engage with the Declaration and use that in their political implementation. And many Indigenous governments in Canada have endorsed the Declaration and use it in their policy making. So that sort of runs you through the gamut of different types of implementation. So, um, in terms of this quote, there are thousands of different languages and cultures in the world, in the different regions of the world. And uh, as former UN Secretary General Boutras Ghali underlined in 1992 at the World Conference on Human Rights. He said, human rights is the common language of humanity. And this is the common language used to negotiate international agreements all over the world. What we'll see very shortly is that Canada does not use this common language when it relates or discusses issues uh, with indigenous peoples. So we could devote a whole presentation on how the federal government actions undermine the UN Declaration. Uh, this evening, we will provide just a few illustrations. The reconciliation practice in Canada is in a severe crisis. And here are some examples. Since 2006, the federal government has refused to consult and accommodate Indigenous peoples on its many adverse positions on the UN Declaration. Canada has lobbied states with abusive human rights records to not support this international human rights instrument. In its endorsement of the Declaration in 2010, which Jennifer referred to, the federal government declared it was now confident that Canada can interpret principles in the Declaration in a manner consistent with its constitution and legal framework. Yet at the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples, which was held in the, at the General Assembly in New York in September 2014, the government claimed it could not support a paragraph in the consensus outcome document of that conference that committed states to uphold the principles of the UN Declaration. Now, Canada also does not acknowledge to Indigenous peoples that Indigenous peoples' collective rights are human rights. And they do so even though such rights have been addressed within the UN human rights system for over 30 years. Federal representatives are not allowed to even discuss this or other key issues with Indigenous peoples. Now, however, in order to evade scrutiny by UN treaty bodies, Canada includes Aboriginal treaty rights in the core document that it submits to such bodies. And they put it under the heading relating to, quote, protecting human rights at the domestic level. So to the international bodies, to escape scrutiny, they say it's human rights. In Canada, they never say that indigenous people's collective rights are human rights. <laughs> 
you won't ever hear, for example, if they're talking about the Enbridge pipeline or the oil sands, that they say, oh yes, we have to deal with the human rights of indigenous peoples. <laughs> so, uh, similarly, here's an example from uh, Professor Alexander Xanthi. There are other jurists that, look, that have also concluded that the Declaration is not merely aspirational and the rights it proclaims are consistent with international law. Now, as already illustrated, the Government of Canada uses a variety of ways to undermine Indigenous people's rights and the UN Declaration. And at the UN, at the international level, such appro approaches include two main ways. One is that Canada exploits inadequate procedural rules of international organizations and forums, such as the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Food and Agriculture Organization, which deals especially with food security, the UN uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, and the World Intellectual Property Organization. All of these organizations deal with critical issues for that relate to indigenous peoples, among others. And um, Canada exploits these forums so that it can lessen any standards that exist in Canada. So for example, if the Supreme Court deals with consent, as we will see that that's what they dealt with in the Chilcotin Nation Aboriginal title case. Canada will go there and say, say to the Food and Agricultural Organization last October, no, no, for us, consent, free prime informed consent only means consultation. <coughs> and that's how they reduce these standards. Now, the second approach is that Canada makes statements to UN treaty bodies that appear to support indigenous people's rights, but actually have no intention of realizing these rights. And this deceptive approach to avoid scrutiny is known as rights ritualism. And Jennifer and I just uh, attended in New York at, uh, at the UN a uh, expert meeting, and part of it was on rights ritualism. <coughs> because it's such an uh, expansive strategy used by states around the world. So they look like they're respecting human rights, but on the ground, they don't really implement those human rights. And on the board, uh, on the screen, you see that rights ritualism is a way of embracing the language of human rights in order to deflect real human rights scrutiny and thus avoid accountability for human rights abuses. And I would also add, when there are substandard and prejudicial actions. Now this is a happy note. It's a picture of Chief Roger William when he's celebrating the victory in the Chilcotin Nation case. And if you look very carefully, right here under his, over his shoulder there, that's a framed copy of the United Nations Declaration on Indigenous Peoples. You can sort of see United Nations there. Right? Now, in the Chilcotin Nation case, it's basically about Aboriginal title, which is crucial because it was a landmark and is a landmark case in Canada. But I'll do here as well is show how the Chilcotin Nation case opens the door to indigenous governance, to lawmaking. It's not just about Aboriginal title. And you won't hear that aspect very often, even from lawyers representing indigenous peoples. But um, you'll see how the argument unfolds. <coughs> In the Chilcotin Nation case, the Supreme Court highlighted indigenous people's consent in nine paragraphs. They highlighted the right to control the land in 11 paragraphs, the right to determine land uses in two paragraphs, 
Such paragraphs are consistent with indigenous people's right to development and their right to self-determination, which is in the UN Declaration and other international human rights law. And this is what Jennifer was referring to. Bring in some of the international concepts. And even if the court doesn't specifically address it in international terms, we're showing how it is consistent now with some of these key international principles. Now, in particular, controlling land use and proactively managing the land, these are two elements that the Supreme Court mentioned. These entail inherent lawmaking powers as well as ownership. They entail inherent lawmaking powers. If you take federal and provincial governments dealing with land use, well, they pass laws on land use. So it's part of it is lawmaking powers. Now, the Supreme Court decision itself refers to Aboriginal laws, including trespass laws. Now, if you look at the bottom of your screen, paragraph 75, the Supreme Court said, Aboriginal title post-sovereignty reflects the fact of Aboriginal occupancy pre-sovereignty with all the pre-sovereignty incidents, most notably the right to control how the land is used. Well, prior to and at the time of European assertion of sovereignty, indigenous peoples exercised inherent and sovereign governmental powers through their own laws and authority. So we're filling in some historical background or legal background related to indigenous peoples. The court did not elaborate on this governmental aspect, but it can be huge in terms of the Canadian Federation. And I'll get into that now. Professor Brian Slattery, who I'm quoting on the screen, is the jurist most cited by the Supreme Court on Aboriginal rights issues. And Slattery has emphasized that these same two paragraphs, 73 and 75, which we just discussed. And he concluded that in the context of Aboriginal title, an Aboriginal nation has the power to legislate for its lands. And Slattery favorably compares Aboriginal legislative jurisdiction with provincial legislative jurisdiction, as you see on the screen. Now, at the bottom quote, Slattery concludes that Aboriginal title is a collective right that carries with it extensive jurisdictional powers. Now, Slattery also indicates that Aboriginal title deals with relations between constituent parts of the Canadian Federation. We are not dealing here with the rights of private landowners or private individuals, as you have been, say, in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. We're not dealing with them as private individuals. Aboriginal title includes such um, rights as ownership that you could say is like fee simple, and the court used that phrase, like, not is. But Aboriginal title goes well beyond fee simple. Private landowners have fee simple rights, but they do not have constitutional government powers. So in Chilcotin Nation, the Supreme Court has opened the door to a major paradigm shift, one that affirms that there are three orders of government in Canada, not just federal and provincial. And the UN Declaration reinforces this, uh, sorry, reinforces this principled framework by affirming Indigenous peoples as self-determining peoples with, their, with the right to their own institutions, perspectives, and laws. Now, the uh, Indigenous Legal Orders in Canada's Constitution is also consistent with the 1996 final report of the Royal Com uh, Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, 
And here you see on the screen that ARCAD concluded that Canada's constitution provides the basis for recognizing Aboriginal governments as constituting one of three orders of government in Canada. In 2011, the Supreme Court ruled that the federalism principle in Canada's constitution requires, quote, nothing less than cooperation. So such cooperation must include indigenous orders of government. Right now what we have is a lot of unilateral action, policies, laws from federal and provincial governments. And most of you, I'm sure, have heard of the federal government's omnibus laws, where they throw everything in, they don't consult indigenous peoples, and they just try and push through in an undemocratic way real uh, important changes uh, affecting indigenous peoples. Now, it's interesting to note that in Article 38 of the UN Declaration, the minimum standard, generally, for all states is to take measures, it's on the screen, in consultation and cooperation with indigenous peoples in order to achieve the ends of the UN Declaration. <clears throat> now, the right of self-determination in international law includes the right of self-government. And that is affirmed in the UN Declaration and also other international human rights law. We put here on the screen Article 3, which is the right of self-determination. Article 4 of the Declaration, which isn't on the screen, indicates that self-government is a part of the right of self-determination. And that's recognized in international law. Now, Article 1.3 of the two international covenants, and the two covenants I'm referring to is at the bottom of your screen, it's the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Both have an identical Article 1 on the way to self-determination. So both have this identical Article 1.3, and it indicates an affirmative obligation of Canada and other states to promote and respect the right of self-determination. Remember I mentioned earlier the uh, uh, rule of interpretation where courts presume that Canada's legislation conforms to international law unless a statute clearly compels another result. So this is an example of a clear obligation that the Canadian government has and that can be used to interpret when we're looking at indigenous people's rights and related state obligations in Canada. Now UN human rights bodies have repeatedly applied Article 1 of the two covenants to indigenous peoples in Canada and other regions of the world. There are many, many um, there's much jurisprudence from the human rights bodies on this point. So now I'll turn it over to Jennifer for the conclusions. Um, so we're just going to wrap it up. Um, and we have just these few conclusions that we're going to share with you. But as you can see, I mean, we covered a lot, of a lot of ground. We knew that we could have done a presentation. We could have taken any of those sections and done the whole evening on it. But we wanted to give you some building blocks of, of all of those pieces. Um, so we see that the Declaration is a principled framework uh, for achieving reconciliation, justice, healing, and peace. And that international human rights law is important for interpreting the rights of Indigenous peoples, and that sovereignty in Canada is shared amongst three orders of governments, and that Indigenous legal orders need to be respected in the Constitution. And finally, in Chocolatin Nation, we see that the Supreme Court has taken major steps to move away from this colonial paradigm. And these steps are really significant to take any principled path for decolonization. And as we have said several times, that we see the UN Declaration as a framework for this journey. And the UN Declaration affirms Indigenous peoples' inherent rights for ownership, jurisdiction, and governance. And reconciliation requires us to embrace these realities that the UN Declaration is a beacon of achievement and hope. And we'll just go back to where we started with Justice Abella, that we need more than the rhetoric of justice, we need justice.